immigration. This is the Ellis Island treatment. They yes. go in there and they say, yes, Fraley, what's your name? Fraley, they say, yeah. So if he couldn't spell, he spelled it his way phonetically, you see. Yeah. So uh, he had three brothers, and each one spelled it differently. Got it. So one spelled the, the German way, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. Right. And the other one spelled it F-R-E-E-L-I-N-G. And he spelled it. So we knew which part of the family came from the way they spelled it. Right. When, when did you first enter into this field, and, and how was it developed uh, at that point? Well, when I was uh, in high school, when I was in high school, I, uh, and I did some drawings for the annual, uh, there was a, another name uh, that appeared that I, a, a fellow I never met who was going to school then and drawing for the, uh, for the annual uh, by the name of Hugh Harmon. And uh, then there was a contest there given by the Kansas City Post. That's a paper that's extinct today. And this is in Kansas City? In Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, <coughs> that, that paper went out uh, of its existence about in the 40s or 50s, I don't know, about the 40s. But anyhow, they had a contest for, for students of high school age for cartoonists. So I entered the contest, made a drawing, and sent it in, and I won the contest. But there was, there was second and thirds, and one of them was Hugh Harmon, whose work I admired very much. I didn't see how I could win, and he didn't. And I never met the man. And I, there was an ad in the, an ad in the uh, paper, for a, uh, for a boy, an office boy who could uh, who could draw in a place called the United Film Ad Service, where Walt Disney started. And so I went to answer the ad, and I didn't have enough nerve to go in. I got to the door, and I figured my work is not professional enough. So I turned around and went back. But ironically, I guess fate uh, was destined to get me into the business. And a couple weeks later, the same ad appeared. So I. I got nervous enough and I entered the place and asked for the job, and I got it. And Hugh Harmon was working there. And you were on your road, and the road took you in 1927 to Walt Disney's uh, very first animation. Uh, Walt factory, Disney had just call. left United, uh, I mean United Film Ad Service in Kansas City to come to to uh, California to make a cartoon. I think he was doing a thing called Alice and. Alice in Wonderland. It was called Alice Comedy, where he used a live action character against a cartoon backdrop. And he brought up Iwerks out here, who was working there also. And a few of the people who were uh, pioneers in the industry came from Kansas City and from that United Film Service. Up Iwerks was one. I don't know if you call the name or not. Uh, Hugh Harmon was another one. Rudy Ising was another one. Um, a fellow by the name of Ben Hardaway, who uh, that <coughs> gave us, it was called Bugs Hardaway. That's how Bugs Bunny got its name. Right, I was reading From that. Bugs Hardaway. I noticed you used the word cartoon, and cartoon to some people in the animation field is a derogatory term. Do you, do you feel that way? No, I don't. I, I feel it's descriptive. You know, I, I do feel it's descriptive of, of the medium, whether it's a uh, newspaper medium or whether it's motion pictures. It's still a cartoon, it's a caricature. Uh, and whether it's of animals or people, or whatever, it's caricature. And, and what was the state of the art in 1927 when you and Walt Disney were working together? Of the animated art, you mean? Yes, cartoons in... in well, I was doing uh, there, uh, the only animated cartoon I knew or saw at that time was, was Terry Tunes. Paul Terry was doing, and I used to see those in the theater. And I think once in a while I caught a Max Fleischer cartoon. But that's the only that's the only information I had about animation. I really didn't know how it was done. I just knew it was hand was drawn by somebody, but how they got it on film, I had no idea. And a lot, a lot of people today don't know how it gets on film. They never think about it. It's like the television tube, you just look at it, you don't know how it got there, you just look at it without a lot of question. Um, I forgot what your point was. Well, I just what, what you and Disney were doing 
But perhaps you could tell us exactly, uh, br perhaps briefly, what that process is. As, as I understand it, it's just hundreds and hundreds of drawings on a piece of uh, celluloid. Well, it's, it's no different. Uh, basically, it's no different than motion pictures, if you know what motion pictures are. Motion pictures are a series of, of photographs, one after another, in different positions. Rather than having a human photograph, we drew the, we draw those positions. And so we, we originate a character that would, that's from our imagination, and we do basically the same thing that a motion picture does. That we put a character in there moving and acting. Instead now, of photographs, there's drawings, and there's literally yeah. thousands of them. For every movement, there's, there's a different position. Tremendously painstaking procedure, and I guess you need a huge staff to accomplish that. Well, one person can do it, it just takes them that much longer. If it's one person, it's naturally it's the work of one man is better controlled. Right. Uh, when it's a, uh, it's a group of people, then you have to have some a, a director to direct those people to keep it uniform. And uh, the big job is to get the character to act the same and seem the same and the same personality emerge from the drawing as as he intended to be, because each one would give it his own concept. People see. And you were that director. I was that director. When you, and when you went to Warner Brothers in the early 1930s, a new type of cartoon character, it seemed to me, started to emerge. What, what did you have in your mind as to the kind of characters that Warners would create? Well, when I, when I came to Warners, uh, I started with Hugh Hum and Rudy Icing, and we did a thing called Bosco. Uh, and uh, very few people are familiar with the character because of the early days of sound. Was Bosco an animal or uh, a... We didn't know what he was, to tell you the truth. Was, just, a cre just a critter, right? Yeah. Eh? He was uh, more or less a human character compared to Mickey Mouse. Everything had to be black and white. And since Mickey was a black and white character, uh, we figured he must be black and white to read well. So it was a creation. The character was really created by Hugh Harmon, the design. We never knew what, whether he was a boy or a, a Negro or, or an animal. We really didn't know. It just it was a, it's just an image. And uh, but we used that Hugh and Rudy. Really, uh, ironically, the. Uh, uh, Hugh and Rudy and myself, and a fellow by the name of Ham Hamilton, I don't know if that name uh, rings a bell with anybody or not, but he was one of the early animators with, with uh, Walt Disney. In fact, he was there before Albi Worship, before Hugh Harmon, before myself. Uh, we did a thing called uh, Bosco, the Talk Inc. kid, I-N-K, uh, when sound first came in, and we beat we beat Walt Disney to it. We were doing a sound, one with sound. We did the the voices first, and then we did the animation through the voice, like we do today. Walt was doing a thing called Steamboat Willie at the time with uh, with uh, Ub Iwerks, but he had not any. Uh, he did not uh, uh, think of it as sound cartoon. Only well, sound came in afterwards, and he he put sound to it. So Steamboat Willie, uh, he put sound to it. But we did it the reverse the way you do it today. We did the sound and then the animation to that. And um, but it never got off the ground because we didn't do a full cartoon. We just did about three minutes to uh, to d demonstrate that we could do uh, sound cartoons with uh, with dialogue, music. And I took it to New York to try to sell it, but they didn't buy it because it wasn't a full cartoon. But Disney came out at that time uh, with that uh, with Steamboat Willie that made a hit, and then he came out with a skeleton dance, which was a big hit. By that time, uh, everybody was looking for an animated cartoon, and Warner Brothers was looking for one. And we had a group together trying to to sell a cartoon, which was Hugh Harmon, Rudy Icing, myself, and Hamilton. And uh, a fellow by the name of Schlesinger was, was uh, looking for somebody to do an animated cartoon at that time. And he got Hugh Harmon. I was in New York working for Crazy Cat, Charles Mintz. 
and uh, he, uh, we started the first, at that time it was 1930, we started and made the first Looney Tune, which was Bosco. Right. Now, Steamboat, Steamboat Willie made Mickey Mouse a star. Yes. Was Warner saying, we need a character, and is that where Bugs Bunny came from, a character to answer Disney? Bugs Bunny came much later. Mm -hmm. uh, Bugs Bunny, we, uh, we produced Bosco cartoons. Hugh Harmon, that means we, was Hugh Harmon, Rudy Isaac, and myself, for about two years, I think it was, when uh, Hugh wanted more money from uh, Schlesinger, and uh, Schlesinger refused to give more money to do the cartoons with. So they split, and uh, we did some work for Paul Terry and did a few cartoons for them. Meantime, Hugh was looking for some other source and MGM wanted to make some cartoons, so they, Hugh Harmon, Rudy Icy, went with MGM. And, and uh, Leon Schlesinger was tempting me to come over there. Uh, and finally I made a deal with Schlesinger, and um, I went over with well, Warner Brothers. And of course the Bosco character was, belonged to Hugh Harmon. Uh, he owned the copyright, so we had no character at all. And Schlesinger was making, it, uh, making some cartoons with with a fellow of mine by the name of Earl Duvall, Jack King. They were, or, uh, Jack King was, had been with Disney, but they were very bad cartoons, so Leon was uh, tempting me to come with them, so I did. I finally made an arrangement with Leon to come over there and make cartoons. And I, naturally, I was, we were looking for a, a character, because we didn't have Bosco, we didn't have any main character. They were doing a thing called Buddy, which was very bad. Buddy cartoons, or black and white and Buddy. And so I had to dig up a character. And uh, I did a little thing with a classroom uh, after a few cartoons. I did one that was a classroom with little kids in it. And one of the kids was uh, Porky, and one of them was called Ham and Eggs, and another little kid was called Kitty, a little kitten. kitten. And Porky was the one that stuttered. This is Porky Pig. This is that how was he was Porky born. Porky Pig. And I had a fellow who actually stuttered do the voice for me, but it was uncontrolled. I couldn't control his voice because he, he had to recite, he had to recite the right of Paul Revere. And he got to the, he'd get up and record. And at that time we were doing uh, sound on film rather than on tape. They didn't have tape in those days. It was on film, and film was very expensive. And he would get up and he'd recite the, the ride of Paul Revere. He'd say, listen, my children, you shall hear the mere, the mere, the mere. And then we'd say, oh, wait a minute, cut. You know, and that would make him nervous, and he got worse. And we just ran hundreds of feet of film and never really got the thing on tape, you know, I mean on film. So finally so you had to we bring realized that we had to have somebody who could imitate and control stuttering. Yeah. And that's how Mel Blanc came into it, because a fellow by the name of Henry Charles was a radio announcer at KFWB, which was a Warner station, radio station, uh, said he had a brother who, could, who was a mimic, and he brought his brother was Mel Blanc. And Mel Blanc has been the voice of the Warner's and cartoons been the over cartoons the years. ever since. So that was the birth of Porky Pig, and that was the first character we had. Yeah. Uh, a a well-known character. I think it became the better known than the others for a while. Hearing that story brings those Warner's characters back in my mind. Mm -hmm. And they are different from the Disney characters, I think, which, which tend to be a little bit more cute and lovable. Yes. The Warner's characters all seem to have those kind of idiosyncrasies, those kind of rough edges. Complete extroverted characters. When, when you were creating Yosemite Sam and, and Porky Pig and, and Sylvester the Cat and, and Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny were coming up. Uh, you, did you, you must have had some pretty oddball characters in mind to base them on. And, oh, no, i tell you how they emerged. Uh, they emerged uh, because we were a group who were not introverted in any way. Uh, we did our thing and nobody seemed to say don't do this or don't do that. Um, Disney, who were doing uh, the classic things, they were doing the, the, Looney, uh, the 
what were they called? Silly symphonies at the time, I think, which were class things like the old mill and uh, some of the class things that we knew that we could not compete with. And we tried. We tried to compete, but we didn't have the, the qualified people to do that kind of thing or the control. But each, everybody did his own thing, did, tried to outdo the next guy. We were, there were about three or four units of people. And so we just uh, tried to be as funny as we could, rather, or as silly as we could, uh, rather than trying to be as artistic as we could. Were you laughing all the time as these things were created? Was it fun? Well, yeah, sure, it was fun. Uh, naturally, if you saw it on the screen and, uh, and you got laughs and the people in your audience laughed, it encouraged you to do more and more of that. That's how the, the pie in the face, gun blasts and things. The more violent it was, the better, the more the audience laughed. You were really probably inspired by slapstick comedy from the 20s. That's right. right. Well, it, it was a more of a, a high school attitude towards cartoons rather than the sophisticated, uh, grown-up ad adult kind of a thing. And uh, that became, uh, it, it seemed to grow, the, the, uh, the kind of thing that we did experiment with, experimented with. Uh, when it was successful, that encouraged more of the same kind of thing, a little broader. And the more it went along, the broader we got, you know. Uh, and of course, good taste had to come into it after a while, and then uh, that was controlled. Good taste was kind of a shackle on your team, I would think. Well, we, yes, but uh, you can be you can be violent, and you can be slapstick without, and still have use good taste. It, get, it got beyond good taste at some time, so. Did you ever think that these characters that you were creating, talking about Yosemite Sam again and Sylvester the Cat, you see them everywhere now. They're part of our culture. They're as, they're as important as any movie star ever has been. It, when did you see that taking hold? Well, you know, it really didn't dawn on us that, well, we knew we, we were more successful because of the bookings. Uh, and uh, The Disney things, start sliding. Mickey Mouse became a square character, but Walt didn't dare change him because uh, he couldn't change that image of Mickey Mouse. It was so so successful. All the characters, he had Pluto and characters like that, but he, he didn't think that the kind of humor that Warners were doing is the kind of thing he wanted to do. He, uh, he felt he built this empire on his type of thing, and uh, he was going to stick with it. But the people that worked with him, who were very talented people, would uh, say, what would Walt want? Not what they want. We didn't have that restriction. And uh, we do what we thought was right. And nobody, we didn't have to go to management. Jack Warner didn't say, you know, let me see the story, let me see the storyboard, and restricted us on that. He looked at the cartoons. If he liked it, he said, that's a funny cartoon. If he didn't, he said, that is not as good as the last ones. And that's about all the control there was. And of course, we'd naturally out to please him, but there was no control. He didn't try. In fact, he, I think it's because he wasn't as interested as Walt would be as what was going on. And it just, it just went wrong, wrong uh, along the right slot, you know, happened to be. And, uh, the kind of humor we had, we didn't realize. I don't think it really took hold till, uh, till we quit making them. But they were still in circulation, and, and they just continued to be more and more popular. Yes, we, uh, so of course, you know, not, no new ones were made since I left there. A, a, a few of them that um, were failures. Yeah, let's catch up to that. Warners, after all of this success in animation and creating these memorable characters, Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, Sylvester the Cat, Daffy Duck, closed their animation studios in 1960, mm -hmm. or 61, I believe. And uh, what was, was it just becoming too expensive, or did they feel it was going well, out yes. of fashion? Well, uh, yes, television came into it. Television came into it. They couldn't get their money back from theaters. Theaters quit running them. Uh, as you know, as today, you can't get them into a theater because uh, people don't go see a cartoon. They love 
the cartoons if they see it, but they don't go to see it. They go to see a picture. Star Wars, for instance, doesn't need a cartoon. If uh, I was the manager of a theater and running Star Wars, I wouldn't hold up your audience they, uh, to, uh, to see a cartoon when they can go out and buy popcorn and candy and peanuts, which they make a lot of money on. So a tradition was broken. It was the end so of the So the theaters quit running them because it didn't pay them to run them. Yeah, it's, it's like a newspaper. Your newspaper runs strips, cartoon strips. And if they quit running the strips, the people, people are not going to quit buying the paper. If they enjoy it while it's there, it's an added spice. But uh, they don't buy it because of the cartoon strip. You were far from through at this point, though. Myself? Because, because very shortly after that came a character called the Pink Panther. Right. Can you tell me how that came about, Fritz? Well, when, uh, when Warners closed their, their doors, uh, I went over to with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Barbera to do a feature with Yogi Bear. So I did the feature. I took some of my people with me, a fellow by the name of John Dunn, a writer, and another fellow by the name of Vic Hobbush was a was a an artist, and we did a we did a feature with Yogi Bear for for Bill and Joe. Uh, during that time, uh, De Patty, who was um, the son of of uh, Ed De Patty, who was uh, the uh, business manager of in fact, he ran the studio for Jack Warner. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. Thank you. Someone approached you to create a cartoon character who became the Pink Panther. Who was that? Blake Edwards. Blake Edwards um, came to, well, David and I were in business. We were doing commercials. And we were doing whatever came in the shop. In fact, Jack Warner gave us this, the studio at the time. And I guess through the influence of David's father, naturally. Uh, he did, uh, I think Jack Warner liked me, personally, because he told a few people, he says, there was Chuck Jones, myself, and Bob McKimson working at the time. And I guess he shined up to the cartoons. I didn't I used to see Jack Warner just once in a while. I don't think very often did I see him. And he always said, I like the little guy. Yeah, that was I don't like the big guy, which was Chuck. But it remained that Chuck and I uh, stayed with, uh, prior to, uh, to the closing, Ch they were going to put the Warner characters on uh, nighttime television. And we did uh, 26 shows, I think it was, half-hour shows, compilations of uh, our work, and bridging material like they're doing today. And uh, that's how he got to know us. And, and we, he, we signed different contracts because uh, a, better, a better deal because of the television deal that they had. Warner's was in television as much as Jack Warner resisted television, he finally gave in to it. And we sold the Bugs Bunny show to, uh, I think it was ABC. Uh, for nighttime, and they went on nighttime shows. So, um, did someone say to you, Jack Warner got need to know me that well? Yeah. Anyhow, after we, uh, after the place was closed, and we went to Mr. Warner and asked him if we could uh, rent the studio because it was useless to them, he says, I'm going to give you a good start. And he says, I'm going to give you the whole studio. That meant the cameras and just the way we left it, with paper, pencils, all the supplies, and the building for $500 a month. So that put David and I in business. And we started doing commercials and anything that came along. And one day, uh, Blake Edwards, who was uh, working on a thing called The Great Race on the Warner Lot, said he just finished a picture. He shot the picture, I think, in Italy, uh, called The Pink Panther. Yeah, and he wanted to know if we could design a title for that. He wanted an animated character. So uh, I read the script, 
and uh, saw some of the film, and the first scene in the, in the film was something about a jewel that, that they held up, uh, that they... Uh, the jewel itself was called The Pink Panther, wasn't it? Yeah. And this was a jewel robbery film. A jewel robbery with David Niven, and, uh, and he said, uh, this jewel ha has a flaw in it, and it, it, it was a pink flaw, he says, it looks a little bit like a, an animal, like a pink panther or something. That was all it was that, that tied into the show at all. The, the reason they called it the Pink Panther for some reason. So he says, can you come up with a title for it? Anyhow, naturally the word Pink Panther uh, was, the, was the key word to doing a character called the Pink Panther. So I designed a character and a title and I worked with two or three fellows there and I did a title for the Pink Panther, a storyboard. And I took it to Blake and he loved it. And then we took it over to the Mirrors and Marty Giroux was the producer and he just flipped when he saw it. And especially when I played with the words Pink Panther, Pink Ant and all that, if you remember the title at all. And uh, he just flipped. Well anyhow, when I did this thing, I produced this thing, David and I, it got great notice. And um, all the critics says the title was better than the picture itself, you know, which I know wasn't very pleasing for, for Blake. He didn't care for that very much, but it did make it. And it was a thing that he hung on to because it made a series of pictures for him. I think he made three, about three Pink Panthers with Peter Sellers. And the character, and, the and character became tremendously Time, popular. Time Magazine, Time Magazine wrote it up. And uh, we just got so much publicity out of it. And it seemed to make a hit, you know. Uh, so, uh, Marish has asked me to, uh, uh, to come up with a short subject. It says uh, we might as well go in and make a series of shorts. Based on the Pink Panther. Based on the Pink Panther. So I did one called The Pink Fink. And The Pink Fink won Academy Award, the first one we ever made, first Pink Panther ever made. Do you think you could, you could draw the Pink Panther for us? I believe I can remember. Maybe while we're talking and, and you can right. maybe surprise us with something. Yeah, else. I'll do that. Uh, that wasn't your first Academy Award. You won five, I believe. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't receive them. Oh, I, uh, I, my pictures won it, but everybody, all everybody, the producers, everybody everybody else shared. collected them, yeah. This great animated team. The Pink Panther is right up there with Bugs Bunny and, and Mickey Mouse as probably the, the most, three most famous cartoon characters in the world. Well, that's true. Uh, the Pink Panther, when people find that I have, uh, that I'm a creator of this thing, they always usually ask for the Pink Panther. Uh, they know that uh, I asked, well, do you want Bugs Bunny or Pink Panther? Most of them want the Pink Panther. For you to draw them. Because it's, yes. Apparently it's a, it's a more, contemporary character. But like the other Warner characters, a bit of a rascal, too. Got those. Yes, I guess the same, same kind of humor sneaks in to both characters. But he has a, uh, basically, uh, I think the music has so much to do with the success of the Pink Panther. Henry Mancini. Mancini. Yes. And uh, I, that's the way the thing started. I think if it wasn't for Mancini's Pink Panther theme, I doubt whether we would have had the success we did. I know he gets a royalty every time that theme is played. Do, oh, does Chris yeah. Freeling get a royalty every time the Pink Panther is, is uh, seen on the screen or in comics? Uh, well, I get, yes, I get a portion of the, uh, the residuals on it. So he's been very good to you? Yes. He, well, it turns out he was very good. We've been very good to him, too. Absolutely. And um, um, the uh, the Warner characters, I don't I don't receive any royalty on it. Uh, but there's there's other terms that I've arranged. But the, I I heard something about those Warner characters and and about all the work that was done on them, and that's that much of the original work, the original film, has uh, celluloid has been destroyed. Yes. How did that happen? 
Well, it's a storage problem. I have the same problem with all the, all the things I made of the Patty Freelings. Uh, we have to store it or destroy it. Uh, we can't keep it forever because some of it is useful, some of it isn't, but it amounts to a lot of space. And um, it's kind of tragic, though, isn't it? A big part of America's cultural history, or our cultural well, it's history. it's recorded on film. So I don't think it's lost. I think people like to to have a one of the drawings usually, uh, but I don't think the uh, as you saw some of the film, it's never it's recorded and it's and it's always uh, there. So I just don't think it's really a, no, a lost art at all. It's not like destroying a painting. <coughs> you know, I'm sure that there's a big difference, but... You're going back to Warner's now. After 20 years of being on your mm -hmm. own with your own production company, to Patty Freeland. Mm -hmm. Do you think Warner's cartoons can be what they were? How much is animation? I don't see why not, but I don't think we'll ever get back to produce them like we did before. Why is that? The cost. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, I, as a... Uh, as a director at Warner Brothers, when I was directing there, was earning $200 a week. I finally got up to $250. Uh, and I turned out 10 to 12 cartoons a year. The guys, the directors who were doing it today, received between $1,000 and $1,200 a week. And they take eight weeks to do one. They can't turn out over four or five a year. The animators earn, were earning $75 to $125 a week when I was directing. Some of them got up to $150 a week. And now I receive anywhere between $800 and $1,000 a week. So it's labor costs and... Uh... Costs, and then, and then they don't produce. The last year I was in business with the Patty Freeling, uh, which was... 79. We found that's what drove us out of business, by the way. You wonder why we quit making them and closed shop is that we found that our costs were 24% higher than they were a year before. But the biggest shock was that people turned out 30% less than they did the year before. So it was a, an aggregate of about 54% higher from the year before. And the interest wasn't there. People didn't have the interest or the drive. I understand that's a disease to the whole country and the whole world today. The labor is just not inspired to do anything or have no drive. And that was the difference between what I did when I was at it. I was inspired. I loved what I was doing, and I wanted to do as much as I could. Time meant anything. I didn't mean a thing. If I had to work uh, Saturdays or Sundays, I worked Saturday or Sunday. If I had to work nights, I did nights. Nobody asked me to do it. I just did it on my own. You ask somebody to work an hour overtime, hey, you've got to pay them triple time or something, you know. They refuse to do it. But I think that's what's lost, the inspiration, the, the desire to do things uh, and to be inspired. Somehow it's gone. I don't know what happened. Were the Warner characters, Daffy and Tweety and Sylvester and so on, were they like friends to you? Did you look well, on them I, as people I who you them knew? As, I think of them as for real. I never think of them as a drawing. I'm drawing somebody, I'm trying to draw, make a drawing of, of that duck somewhere or that Bugs Bunny somewhere. And I can remember what he looks like. And I try to draw him. I, I just, uh, you feel that he's, he lives somewhere. And I, as, as, uh, ironically, uh, People who used to come to visit the studio would want to come and see the set that Bugs Bunny worked on. They believe. Without thinking, he's just a drawing. And then when you explain it to them, and these are adults, not children, and they just never have any idea of, of how these things are made, how, they're, how they come to life. Because they're for real. On the screen, they're for real. Bugs Perhaps Bunny, that's for the best. Bugs Bunny is for real. And I believe in the, in the eyes of most people who watch these things, they think this character lives. 
Uh, I, they don't stop to analyze, but they say, well, Bugs Bunny, he's a personality. You know, he's not somebody who drew him. He's that character that's been drawn. Well, you can't see it, can you? No, we did a visual way question. Hmm? So what was your question? Can you draw? Are you ready? Okay. If you could draw a couple of your favorites while we're going along, Fritz, we'd, we'd sure enjoy that. But Sylvester the Cat's one of them. I understand. Sylvester, yes. I haven't drawn him for quite a while, but I'll make an attempt. You know, it's funny. Some of the Warner characters, and you say that people identify with them so strongly. I think of Sylvester and Daffy Duck. They're always frustrated, aren't they? And the, uh, the, other, the, the others, perhaps. Basically, uh, that's the, the humor of it. People that's identify with that. Yes, I think so. I think they like to see. That's why uh, uh, Daffy and, and uh, Yosemite Sam and those characters are, are uh, successful. And Sylvester is because they're really, uh, they're really aggressive villains, you know. And um, when they fall on their face, people like it. You couldn't do it to the. You couldn't do it to Porky, for instance because he's a lovable, sweet little character, a boy scout. Nobody really, really liked to do it, Parky, because he was too square a character. Uh, and, uh, but Sylvester, who, who um, falls on his face, attempting to get an innocent little character like Tweety, uh, when he falls on his face, you, it's comedy, you know, you, you get a laugh. It's like a, the Dodger, if you see a Dodger, walk across the room, slip on a banana peel, and fall, you're going to laugh. But if you see a little old granny walk through and do the same thing, you're not going to laugh. You're going to be sympathetic to it. They're so bit, that's the difference. They're a bit nasty, too. Daffy's a bit nasty, and Yosemite Sam's a bit nasty. And yes. You don't mind seeing them take a fall. Well, Daffy is usually a greedy character, you know, and he goes to any extreme to, to get the, the results, you know, in his favor. Could you show us Sylvester? I'd love to see how... I'll, I'll make an attempt to do Sylvester. They're basically... He's just... Originally, when I designed this character, I, I tried to think of a cat who was really a clown. That's why I give him this big red nose. And I, I, I intended to give him a baggy pants look, you know. And uh, he uh, he can't, turned out to be a pretty good foil for. Uh, he he worked against a character called. Uh, it was just a it was a uh, a lovebird that he that was trying to commit suicide because his love turned him down, and. Uh, he was trying to get the cat to eat him. And then this cat says, oh, no, you don't. There's something wrong. You wouldn't want me to eat you unless there's something. You must be poisoned or something. You know, so the character, that was the first Sylvester. And I thought of him as a, as a real clown. And I gave him a very low crotch, like baggy.